أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا أبو القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المبلومين ولعنة الله على أدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين آمين يا رب العالمين Dear respected viewers, wherever you may be joining us from, thank you for tuning in once more to this, your live show from Karbala, the show in which I'll be hosting it, your host, Yahya Seymour, Back to the Basics, in which we've been discussing over the past approximately two weeks now, an approach to how to engage with some of the doubts and objections, or even just general questions which are raised about our religion, by those who happen to follow other schools and indeed even at times those who happen to follow the same school of thought that we belong to. Over the past few weeks we've been trying to, at the very least, introduce the concept of engaging with these questions in a rather different way from the way that we as Muslims have traditionally been programmed to in our engagements with others. And we've been introducing the concept known as the concept of a world view that we look at our religion as an entire package, an entire interconnected set and system of beliefs as opposed to just a series of isolated beliefs which should be justified, explained away and thoroughly analysed individually. Because as we've stated, we as human beings have a limited amount of time on our hands. Because we do have a limited amount of time on our hands and I realise that time is indeed of the essence, I have wasted much time trying to give a brief demonstration of how this particular method would work in application in applying it to other worldviews in our engagements with them. And yesterday I laid out more of a comprehensive framework as to how we should analyse a person's worldview. Not necessarily by asking them for a label, because at the end of the day a label does very little justice to the individual we speak to. A label could mean a thousand and one things, and unfortunately today we as Muslims, particularly we the Shia, the followers of the original Islam, as was taught by the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, we all know what it's like to be conflated with others who call themselves Muslims. That's not to say that every single non-Shia is a bad person, but what I mean is that unfortunately Islam receives very negative press in the limelight in today's day and age. And so we're not strangers to the need to go beyond merely simple labels and conflating one person who labels himself with one word as the same thing as the other person that labels himself with the same word. Someone might traditionally say that I lean towards the right wing of politics or that I'm traditionally conservative and depending on what era you belong to that is going to be seen in a particular way. Likewise someone who said 10 years ago that I'm a liberal it might have had very different connotations to someone that says it today. And again, in, depending on what country you're in, that would have very different connotations to what it would mean in another country. So when we say that I'm a Muslim or I'm a Shia, these things all have very different connotations depending on, upon the context. So in analyzing worldviews, in asking these bigger questions, these major questions, which show us how a person's thinking is shaped, we're able to go beyond merely looking at the labels. But unfortunately, in, dare I say, the time constraints that I'm faced with in the duration of a half an hour live show, it's been quite difficult for me to address some of the concerns that the viewers who are following me may have. And I was blessed this morning to receive some concerns by a brother who's been following along. And so I'd like to address those concerns today, inshallah ta'ala. Um, tonight, I'd like to address those concerns before we move any further on with the concept of a worldview. But once we have these out of the way, inshallah ta'ala, we will be applying the discussion of worldviews and starting at the very, very basics. That is to say, we will not be discussing other schools of Islam. Rather, we will be discussing how we build and construct our very own worldview. But before I do so, allow me to just clarify some of these questions which the brother asked, and they were as follows. The brother was quite concerned over my portrayal of uh, a particular school of thought of the Muslim theological schools, which of course is the Salafi, or more popularly known as the Wahhabi school of thought. Now, I don't particularly encourage people to call them Wahhabis because they don't like this title. But in theory, they are the very thing which is known as Wahhabis by the popular media. 
For the sake of politeness and, dare I say, etiquette, we'll be referring to them as the Salafi or the Athari school of thought from now on, inshallah ta'ala. The brother asked me in regards to whether or not my portrayal of the Salafi school of thought was one which was accurate to the claims that they make. For I had stated that the Salafi school of thought undermines the intellect in its attempts to engage with theology. And I had stated this quite categorically. I had stated quite categorically that it therefore excludes itself because it doesn't make the cut as it undermines the ability to trust the reason and in doing so reduces itself to an absurd worldview which is not worthy of being followed. I very much stand by what I said and some might take issue to that due to the very same reasons that the brother who contacted me this morning took issues to this particular statement which is that he had seen certain statements attributed to people that we could call giants or very revered figures within the Salafi school of thought who had stated otherwise and the two that he brought up or the one that he brought up rather but I will increase him by giving him a second name too who says the same thing is of course Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah has a whole work which is four volumes pertaining to the apparent conflicts between the intellect and textual sources and how we are ought to engage with such apparent conflicts and contradictions. Of course, Ibn Taymiyyah argues that there would never be such a contradiction because the sound intellect would not contradict the textual sources or revealed sources of Islam. Likewise, the second name which I will add to the list of quotations of people who say something similar is his student Ibn al-Qaim al-Jawzi. Ibn al-Qaim al-Jawzi in his book Sawaq al muharqa likewise states the same thing. He states that the intellect does not, or the sound intellect, does not contradict the textual sources of Islam. So given that they have stated this, given that they have made these statements very clear in their works, why is it that I have stubbornly misportrayed them in such a way that I have said that they do not believe this? The very reason and the very example I gave the brother this morning when responding to him was that sometimes people might make a claim but their methodology belies that claim. It essentially falsifies and means that whilst they make a claim they don't really believe it. So an example of that that we're going to see inshallah ta'ala throughout the duration of this show is those who claim that they don't believe in a divine superpower and how at times they contradict that very claim in their behavior. This phenomenon is what we know as, in the English language, as cognitive dissonance, to hold two apparently contradictory beliefs. And I would argue that those who happen to follow the Athari methodology or the Salafi methodology in theology very much fall under this set of adopting two contradictions at the same time. The first contradiction or the first belief which contradicts the second, I should say to be precise, is the belief that they are actually respectful and give a level of position to the human intellect. Because this claim is laid out, particularly by Ibn Taymiyyah in this four volume work, and by Ibn al-Qaim and Jawzi. So they do make this claim. But then I have argued that the methodology they utilize essentially belies that claim and renders that claim to uselessness. Allow me to give further analogies. If we were to state that we respect the intellect, but then we were to suspend the usage of the intellect when it comes to understanding very key doctrines which on the apparent are anti-rational or irrational, to use the word for negating rationality then we are not respecting our rationality. I have said it before, there are three different types of beliefs. There are rational beliefs, there are irrational beliefs, and there are non-rational beliefs. It is necessary for me to clarify all of these prior to moving on any further, 
For I believe this is where the area of confusion that the brother fell into was caused. Rational beliefs are those beliefs which align with human rationality. That is to say, they are fully aligned with the intellect. And nothing contradicts the intellect, nor is a stumbling block for the intellect in accepting them. Now, before I move on any further, allow me to state this. It is very necessary for us to define what the intellect is in order for us to have this conversation. Imam Sadiq has kindly defined the intellect, or rather described the intellect, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, as that by which Ar-Rahman is worshipped. But this is a description. It doesn't tell us much about the intellect other than it has a key role in our salvation and in our Iman. So what would be a good and apt description of what the intellect is? The intellect is essentially the gift which every human sane individual has been given by Allah Azza wa And when we look at the very key basic agreed upon principles of the intellect, we could say there are the three laws of rationality. What are the three basic laws of rationality? They are basically, number one, the law of non-contradiction. That something cannot be 100% right and 100% wrong at the same time. That one thing cannot be the opposite of the same thing at the same time. That makes perfect sense. This cannot be a book and not and the opposite of a book at the same time. I cannot be a finite human being, but at the same time be an infinite deity. These two are contradictions and contradictions never meet at the same point. This is the first law which governs the intellect. The second law which governs the intellect is known as the law of non-excluded middle which is to basically affirm that there, something is either a thing or the opposite of that thing and there is no third option. So this is either a finite object or it's not a finite object. There is no in-between option to those two options. And so we have essentially eliminated that something is either a thing or it is not a thing. There is no third alternative. And the last principle which governs the human intellect is, of course, the law of identity. That the thing in front of us is the very thing that it is. It is not something else. It is these laws which govern the human intellect and allow us to utilize our intellect and allow us to understand the phenomenon around us. In using these laws, we are able to trust our rationality. And in doing so, we are able to live functional lives without going crazy on a daily basis. Dear viewers, let's go for a short break. And when we get back, inshallah ta'ala, I will summarize the laws of the intellect and what the intellect is. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. So essentially, we have, we're stating before the break that the intellect is the thing which functions upon these three basic rules. And every sane human being would agree that these rules are the things which govern the intellect. This is what we mean by the, something to be aqli or non-aqli. If something goes against these three principles, then it is by very necessity non intellectual. It is against reason. So for example, to me, for me to say that Allah Azza wa Jal is all powerful, but then has limitations, would be for me to make an irrational statement. Allow me to repeat that again. Something which goes against these very three basic laws of rationality is what we would call irrational. That is to say, it goes against everything we know, due to our rationality. So for me to say that Allah Azza wa Jal is the infinite creator and is all powerful and was not created, but then for me to say that he has limitations and has a form, this would be an irrational statement. It goes against everything I know rationally. 
And so it would be to contradict my reason. It would be unreasonable. This is an irrational statement. An irrational statement is one which directly clashes with human rationality. But we have a third category of beliefs which do not necessarily conflict nor contradict our rationality. We call these beliefs non-rational beliefs, or some people would call them, I personally don't like this term because it's very confusing, but supra-rational or super-rational. That is to say, above rationality. These are things which now transcend the laws of rationality. But by, by transcend, we do not mean that they are in conflict with the laws of rationality, but rather they are beyond the remit and scope of rationality. So allow me to give an analogy which I constantly give, inshallah ta'ala. When a mother gives birth to her newborn baby, often you would find that a mother is able to sacrifice herself immediately for that newborn baby. But this goes against everything we know about the concept of human love. Why? Because love is not normally something experienced between two people that do not know one another. Rather, love is an expression of a feeling or an emotion which is developed between two people that have a knowledge of one another and an understanding of one another. You do not normally find that a man is willing to sacrifice his life and holds someone so dear when he has never met such a person before in his life. Likewise, you would find the same is true of females. Rather, we would be willing to sacrifice ourselves for people like our mothers our sisters, our wives, our brothers, our fathers, our grandparents, our best friends perhaps. Why? Because we have formed a relationship with such people. We know them and we know their value to us. Maybe very subjective, but this is the rational process which goes on in our mind. Yet a new mother who's just given birth to her baby this willingness and this insistence to be willing to go to the death to protect that baby is not one which makes sense to us, rationally speaking. It goes against all observable trends. And the reason for this is we traditionally understand love to be something which is understood on the basis of our daily interactions. So this would be a non-rational belief. Or another non-rational belief would be our understanding of certain ghaybi concepts. By ghayb, I mean in Islamic theology, those things which are of the unseen, those things which we have never seen before, and we know about them merely from being told these things via news. So for example, the belief in the jinn is not necessarily a rational belief which we would arrive at using the intellect. The belief in these unseen beings known as the jinn is not something that you and I would naturally, if sitting on a desert island, think to ourselves, wow, there are these unseen beings and they are known as the jinn. No, because we cannot observe them using our rationality, nor can we observe them using the five senses. And therefore, this would be another non-rational belief. That is not to say irrational. This is to say non-rational. We know about them through our knowledge of receiving information in revelation. So these two things must be distinguished. And why I say this is because there is a big difference in believing in that which is non-rational in addition to a very rational basis, and submitting to those things which are irrational. I had already shown and demonstrated in one of the previous episodes that one of the very best arguments for demonstrating the existence of Allah Azawajal depends upon us utilizing our rationality to know that anything with limitations, anything with a distinct set of qualities, these qualities which we can see are limited is a created object. I know that this rock did not bring itself into existence because it has a certain color and it has a certain dimension. 
Did it give itself those dimensions? No. Because had it been infinite, then it would not be finite. Likewise, if I'm to believe this, in order to exclude the rock from being my creator or being infinitely there, I would also have to exclude from my theology the concept of Allah Azza wa Jal being limited in his shape and his dimensions. And yet there are certain theological schools which would tell you that he is limited in his shape and his dimensions. This would be the difference between someone affirming that rationality never goes against the revealed text and someone actually applying this case. Now, the brother also asked me, but Atharis or Salafis are not the only theological school which are non-Shia. That is to say there are other Islamic schools of theology which are not Shia and yet nonetheless believe that we do not have to believe in this literally and we do not have to literally affirm that Allah does have limitations but bila kafir or without going into the howness of such. My response to such a brother is that is true. There are other theological schools which are not Shia who affirm these things and we will be engaging with them when we reach them inshallah ta'ala. I did not merely intend to highlight the Salafis from the start, but rather I intended to demonstrate that there are certain schools of thought within every ideology who don't make the cut for having a long and prolonged discussion with them. Rather, they are excluded from the very start due to the lack of a role that they give to, rev to reason in addition to revelation. So now the question comes in very quickly. How do I deal with those traditions which tell us not to think about the self of Allah Azza wa Jal, the vat of Allah? This is very simple. To think of a vat of Allah Azza wa Jal would be to involve ourselves thinking of things beyond the scope of time. And the vat of Allah Azza wa Jal, the essence of Allah Azza wa Jal, is something which would be again irrational and non-rational for us to even try to assume things about it. We are not claiming that Allah revealed these things and therefore we're going to suspend judgment. No, there's a clear cut difference. And inshallah ta'ala in the next episode, I will also elaborate more upon these differences. It is very important to understand these differences because we are not a blind textualist school like others. We promote and elevate the status of reason as Imam al-Sadiq and the other Imams have described it. It is like the Imams and Prophets, it is a hujjah. Brothers and sisters, thank you so much for joining us tonight once more. And I pray that I have been able to elaborate upon this topic to the best of my ability. If anyone has any further questions, I'm at your service and I pray I will be able to answer them. Thank you for joining us once more from the holy city of Karbala. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mm-hmm.